So, um, so yeah, this is lecture four. And what we're going to do today is finish off section three of my lectures. And that's looking at how dark matter is distributed in the Milky Way galaxy. As I hopefully convinced you yesterday, this is something that's really important if you want to actually detect dark matter. So yesterday, after an introduction and looking at the theory of this, we then started looking at numerical simulations. And I gave you a very rough hand wavy idea of how one does a numerical simulation. We're going to start today by looking at the results from numerical simulations. We're then going to move on to observations and then finish off by talking very briefly about something called small scale challenges to Lambda CDM. And I think this will fit nicely into today and then tomorrow we can do the final fourth section of my lectures on how observations can help us probe the nature of dark matter. So um, on the Padlet website that I showed you last time, there's been sort of four questions about the CMB power spectrum at small L and how theory and observations don't quite match, about the argument for dark matter halos not having reached a steady state, about the bullet cluster being a problem for Lambda CDM and about whether there are any other sort of theoretical density profiles other than the isothermal sphere that I told you about yesterday. And I've now put answers to all four of those questions there in case anyone's interested and any more questions like that, things that are going off piste a little bit, then stick them there and I'll answer them. And obviously that's a really slightly ugly URL. So if you go to the Indico page in the timetable, my slides are uploaded there and I've put this into the first lecture I think it's on page three and maybe it'd be helpful if somebody could maybe just send that round to everybody in, e in an email so it's you know really that URL is really accessible that that'd be nice okay so then moving on to the content so we're looking at results from numerical simulations and as I talked about last time the sim thing to do, but it's still not simple by any means, is just to simulate the dark matter only. However, as Annika Peter will tell you in more detail later in the school, it's the baryons in galaxies play an absolutely huge role in how the, well not huge role, but they play some role in how the dark matter is distributed. So really ideally what you want to do is what's called hydrogen dynamical simulations that simulate not just the dark matter, but the baryons too. So most things I'm going to talk about today with results, I'm going to tell you first what we see in dark matter only simulations, and then how it changes when you add baryons into the simulations. So we're going to start off by looking at the sort of bulk properties of sub halos. So these are the smaller dark matter halos within bigger ones. And on the left here, we've got a sort of picture from the Aquarius simulation, which is a dark matter only simulation. And this is the one that I showed you the movie of yesterday. So this is trying to simulate something that ends up having roughly the same properties, for instance, mass of 10 to the 12 solar masses as the Milky Way. And as you can see, the dark matter distribution at the end of the simulation today isn't smooth. We've got these huge amounts of substructure. And so two things we're interested in is the amount of substructure as a function of mass, as in the mass of the individual small sub halos, and then also how they're distributed radially within the parent halo. So that's then what's shown on the right here. It's DNDM, the number of sub halos as a function of mass, as a function of their mass, going from 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 10 solar masses. And the different coloured curves here are for different simulations they did, labelled 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, improving the resolution, as in using smaller simulation particles and hence being able to resolve think substructure on smaller scales. And what you can see is that to an excellent approximation is a power law. And then this bottom panel, they've just plotted m squared times dndm, just to show you that it's not quite an m to the minus two power law. It's a little bit shallower than that. And in fact, their best fit is a slope of minus 1.90. So what we're seeing is there is a significant amount of structure. And the smaller the mass you go down to, the more subhalos they're, they're finding.
So then coming on to how they're distributed radially, and perhaps if I go back to this slide, you can sort of already see that there appears to be more subhalos in the outer regions and less in the inner regions. And that's just simply coming from the fact that any subhalo that comes into the inner regions, there's the disc, well, in this case, there isn't a disc actually scrub that. It's just that the sort of potential of the halo is bigger, so things are more likely to be tidally stripped and destroyed. And so this plot, again, from Aquarius, the dark matter only simulation, is the fraction of the local mass in subhalos as a function of radius. So going out from sort of the smallest radii that these simulations can resolve of order a few kiloparsecs through the solar radius where we're sat denoted as the dotted line, and then going right the way out to the virial radius, the rightmost dotted line out at a few hundred kiloparsecs. And again, the different colors, the results from sort of different simulations of the same object at higher and higher resolution with red being the highest resolution. So the key results to take away from this is that roughly 10% of the total mass of the halo is in resolved subhalos. We can't say anything about things that are smaller than the, the simulation can resolve, but the stuff it can see, it makes up roughly 10%. So the majority of the dark matter seems like it's smooth, but nonetheless, there's this really significant contribution from the substructure. But then what we also see is as you go in towards the inner regions, that fraction drops off, and that once you get to the solar radius, it's sort of less than sort of a tenth of a percent. So once you get into the sort of the in a region, there's not huge amounts of substructure sort of bombing around in where we are, because as I said before, the subhalos are more effectively disrupted if they come close to the middle of the halo. So then the question is, how, is this, how does this change when you have hydrodynamical simulations that sort of attempt to simulate the physics of the baryons? As I tried to emphasize yesterday, this is a really difficult thing to do. And so again, Annika will tell you more about how it's done. But the key thing is that you have to include prescriptions for how the baryons behave. And so you're not being able to sort of resolve individual stars or clouds of gas. You have to sort of put in a prescription for how energy flows out of them and things like that. And so different prescriptions can end up with sort of slightly different results. And so here we've got results from two hydrodynamical simulations called Apostle and Auriga in blue and orange here. And this plot is the ratio of the number density in these hydrodynamical simulations relative to what we had before in the dark matter only ones. So this dotted line would be if you just if it was the same, if there was no change. And in particular, this plot, they've happened to make it for subhalos in this mass range between 10 to the 6.5 and 10 to the 8.5 solar masses. And so what you see is you get less subhalos surviving in these hydrodynamical simulations. And the suppression of how much less is bigger as you go into smaller radii. So even more subhalos get disrupted at small radii and hydrodynamical simulations. I must admit, I haven't dug into the literature here in enough detail to understand this. My guess is that this, to some extent, possibly comes from putting a disk of stars into these simulations. And as I mentioned before, that yesterday, there's this thing called disk shocking, that when something goes through a disk, it gets perturbed and hence more easily destroyed. The other thing to take away, though, is that actually these two different simulations give different results as to how big this decrease is. So this is just showing you quite how difficult this is to do. So less substructure in simulations with, with baryons in, but it's still significant, especially as you go out to sort of large radii, that overall there's still a significant fraction of the mass in substructure. So actually, I think what I'll do is just pause now in case there's any questions about subhalos from simulations. Yeah. Are there ways to probe the Alumas function with observations and not only with embodied simulations? That's a really good question because obviously what we want to do what the um, 
to know what the real universe is doing. There are some ways it's hard, and I'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow in the context of actually non-villainous cold dark matter where the amount of structure substructure there is gets changed so the answer is sort of yes you can by looking at how they affect tidal streams and in strong lensing so there are ways of doing it but it's tough for the, the error bars are big but I'll, I'll say more about that tomorrow any <clears throat> any other questions i think also in the chat there's nothing all right so we can go on. Okay, so let's come on next to density profiles. And so that's how the density varies as a function of radius within a halo. So this first slide is just some sort of technical things before we go on to look at the results. And so the, before you can sort of decide how the density is varying, you have to sort of define where your halo is and where you think the edge is. And so this comes back to something I talked about way back on Tuesday. And so the usual definition of the edge uses the virial radius, the radius within which the density is delta, the virial over density times the background density, where the virial over density, that's a number that comes from the spherical top hat collapse model that we looked at briefly. And then once you've defined where the edge is via the virial radius, the mass is then easy to compute. It's just the volume times the mean density. And as I alluded to um, back on Monday, there are different conventions for what number people use for delta. This doesn't really sort of have any crucial consequences, but it's just something to be aware of if you're looking at different papers by different groups that they do things slightly differently. So a simple analytic calculation for a universe which was just containing matter and flat, you end up with something which is roughly 200. And some and people often still use that, even though we know we live in a universe which is flat, but also contains a cosmological constant. And with a cosmological constant, the virial overdensity ends up varying with redshift, and its value today would be 333. So sometimes people use that convention instead. And then for reasons I don't understand at all, there's variations in what people use for the background density. In some cases, it's taken to be the critical density. And in other cases, it's taken to be the matter density, which is lower than the critical density because the cosmological constant makes up some of the density. And this is then the third bullet point is something I'll just mention. So if it comes up anyway, you sort of know roughly what's going on and why. All of this means that perhaps the virial radius isn't necessarily the best or and the corresponding mass isn't necessarily the most unambiguous way of labeling a particular halo and how big it is. Something which doesn't depend on conventions is the maximum circular speed. So the circular speed is the speed at which things go around in a circle. And as we saw earlier in the week, it depends on the mass within a given radius divided by that radius. And it turns out in simulations, this has a curve which rises to a peak and then falls off again. And so where you put the cutoff at where you decide the edge of the halo is doesn't affect this peak. So therefore, this peak value of the circular speed is a really much nicer, cleaner proxy for how big a halo is. So that was just an aside. So if you sort of see people labeling dark matter halos in terms of Vmax, that's what's going on. Right, so getting to the point, and that's the density profile. So here we're going to first again look at the results from the Aquarius dark matter only simulations. So this is a plot of a, the log of the density and versus the log of radius going from some 0.1 kiloparsecs out to the edge of the halo. And again, for these five different colors is the increasing resolution. So you can go down and down to smaller scales. And so we talked about the isothermal sphere before, which has this simple r to the minus two slope. So on this plot, that would be a straight line with slope minus two. So we're seeing that's not what happens in these simulated halos. In the outer regions, the slope is steeper, and then it becomes monotonically shallower as we go in. So going back to the 1990s, there was a phenomenological fitting function proposed, which sort of fits this behavior very well. It's called the Navarro-Frank-White profile after the people who proposed it, or 
NFW for short here, and it has this functional form here. So let's sort of unpack the things that are going on here. So RS is something called the scale radius, and it's the radius at which the logarithmic derivative goes through minus two. So it's this point somewhere in the middle where the slope just temporarily is going through minus two on its way from minus three to minus one. And aside, because you'll maybe sort of hear it sometimes, people will often talk about the concentrations of dark matter halos. And the concentration is the virial radius, i.e. where things go out to, divided by this scale radius. So if the scale radius is small, that then leads to a large concentration. And that's the case where this turnover is really happening close to the middle. So that's what sort of meant when some people talk about something having a high concentration. The other thing that's interesting to look at is the asymptotic limits. As R tends to zero in the square brackets, we get a one. And so we just get R to the minus one. As R is much bigger than RS, the R over RS term in the square brackets dominates, and hence we get R to the minus three. So that's sort of how that works out. There has been some discussion about whether the INASTO profile, sorry, the NFW profile is a good fit at small radii, as in is the density profile really tending to a logarithmic slope of minus one? And in these dark matter only simulations, the answer is sort of, well, not quite probably. So again, this is results from Aquarius. And what's plotted here is the logarithmic slope of the density profile minus it. So d lum rho d lum r as a function of radius again. So some of these profiles are things which were fashionable at the time this paper was written, but now people are less interested in. So the lines to focus on here are the dot dashed one and the solid one. The dot dashed one is the NFW profile, which as we've seen before, the slope, logarithmic slope changes smoothly between minus three out in the outer regions through minus two at the scale radius and then asymptotes to minus one at small radii. And then again, the colored lines are the results from these sort of simulations. And then there's sort of perhaps some evidence that these logarithmic slopes, they aren't going to turn over an asymptote to minus one. In fact, they just keep on getting smaller and smaller. And so another phenomenological fitting function that's been proposed, which matches this behavior, is something called the INASTO profile, which has this sort of slightly more complicated form here. RS is still the scale radius where the logarithmic slope is minus two. And then this alpha is a fitting parameter called the shape function that sort of controls exactly how this log logarithmic slope behaves. And so you might well end up seeing this, this Inasto profile also used for modeling dark matter halos. It's arguably a slightly better fit to dark matter only simulations in the inner regions of dark matter halos. But as we'll see in a moment, these small differences are actually dwarfed by probably the uncertainties that come from understanding what the baryons are doing to the density profile. So let's have a look at this. So first up, we're going to have a look at Milky Way like galaxies. So, you know, big 10, bigish 10 to the 12 solar mass things. And these are particular results from a simulation called, or a set of simulations, I think, called Eagle. So again, what we've got log of the density versus log of the radius. The NFW profile is in gray, and the results from their simulations here are in pink. And I must admit, I have forgotten and should have written this on this, my slide what the difference between the dark pink and the light pink is. Um, the vertical dashed line is the resolution of the simulations. And then yesterday I talked about convergence, i.e. doing multiple simulations and checking that the properties you're interested in have converged, i.e. that they don't change. And then they're sort of suggesting that in this case, this arrow denotes their convergence radius. So what this is telling us is the stuff that's going on at really small r, we don't trust that, that's not a physical result, but we can trust things further out. And the key point is there is, a, it seems like 
The results from the simulations lie above the NFS for NFW profile for the smallest radii that are resolved, i.e. about 1.5 to 6 kiloparsecs. And the sort of physical explanation for that is something I mentioned briefly yesterday called baryonic contraction, that the dark matter collapses first, the baryons then fall into the potential well, and in doing so, because of conservation of angular momentum, they pull the dark matter in with them. So that is sort of the understanding of what this is possibly due to. I say possibly, well, if it's happening, that's what it's due to, but the question is whether it's happening. And so this then is looking sort of in not just at Milky Way sized galaxies, but a broader range of galaxies. And so they do the simulations and they look at whether there's what's called a constant density core. So a region in the middle where the density is constant and then they sort of, if there is, they sort of fit what that core radius is. So the plot here is the core radius in kiloparsecs, so going up to 10 and down for something tiny, as a function of the fraction of the, the ratio of the stellar mass of the galaxy to the halo mass. So it turns out that oh, that number is bigger for sort of bigger galaxies typically. So over on the right, we have Milky Way-like galaxies. We then go, as we go left, we go through bright dwarf galaxies, through what are called the classical dwarfs, things that people have known about for many years, like sort of Draco, and then down right at the left to what are called ultra-faint dwarfs, very dim, pathetic dwarf galaxies that have only been discovered relatively recently. And then the data points come in two forms. The circles are what they call a well-resolved resolve core where they're confident that they're definitely seeing a constant density core because its radius is bigger than the scales on which you can trust the simulations the convergence radius and then the squares are ones where actually that's not the case and so this work comes from the fire two simulations and what they seem to be seeing is that stellar feedback i stars forming and gas being sort of pumped around that is very good at producing these constant density cores in bright dwarf galaxies. So this sort of region sort of here where we've got lots of circular points. And in that case, you end up with cores, i.e. central density, constant central density regions. There are a few kiloparsecs across. They say that actually, possibly in Milky Way size things, instead of getting this steepening that we were seeing Previously, you can possibly get a core even in Milky Way sized galaxies. And so my understanding of the sort of state of play here is that it, whether or not you get the profile in the Milky Way sized galaxy going up from the NFW and becoming steeper or flattening off and becoming constant depends on how you model the baryonic physics. And it depends in particular, and this is getting quite technical, on what threshold on the density of the gas you use for whether star formation occurs or not. So to summarize all of this, I would say that on the whole, the NFW profile is an excellent fit to the density at the vast majority of radii. However, we're still not completely sort of understanding what goes on at small radii, in particular in sort of biggish Milky Way sized galaxies. So again, I'll pause now in case there are any questions about density profiles. Um, thanks. Uh, this is going back a little bit to the theory, but I don't quite understand why the virial overdensity should vary with redshift. Right. No, so that's a good question, as in you is getting at the underlying physics. And the answer is because what we've got going on here is a sort of competition between gravity and the expansion of the universe. And if the cosmological constant is non-zero, that then affects the expansion of the universe and hence affects this competition and qu affects quite how overdense what you end up with is. What I'll have to admit is I've never not thought about this in enough detail to explain to you why the, the effect goes in the direction it does. But the bottom line is it's because 
the, the background components of the universe are affecting how the universe expands and hence this competition between expansion and collapse. That makes sense, thank you. Any other questions? It uh, doesn't look like it. Okay, so then we'll come on to the local velocity distribution. And so by local, remember that means at the solar radius where we're doing wind direct detection and at lab axion experiments. And so what's the distribution of the dark matter here? Now, in this case, I'm not going to talk about results from dark matter only simulations because they seem to be seeing interesting deviations from the simple Maxwellian distribution of the standard halo model. And it turns out that when people have then done simulations with baryons, they're seeing actually something in this case that's sort of boring, but boring in a good way. It means, you know, there's sort of, it turns out the standard halo model in this case, in terms of the velocity distribution, is a pretty good assumption. So there were three groups that I think put papers on the archive on the same day a few years ago looking at this. So they were using different prescriptions, again, for the subgrid physics of how the baryons behave, but they found roughly consistent results in this case. So I've picked figures from just one of these papers because they were the ones that made the point I wanted to make best. And so this is sort of actually a complete tangent, but I'll say it anyway, is um, people paying attention to your work happens a lot if they use your figures in their talks. And so when making figures, it's good to have one eye on, does this figure really clearly explain the physics? And if it does, other people are more likely to use your figures to explain the physics. And when you're busy working on something yourself, it's really easy to make really complicated, messy figures that explain everything. And it's good to have some of those to explain the details in your papers, but having a few really clear figures, you know, is, is a really good thing for multiple reasons. And so in this case, this is for a particular simulated halo well we've got one on the left we've got a dark matter only simulation of a particular halo the one in the middle is a sph simulation of the same halo i.e with baryonic physics and then on the right is an sph simulation of a different dark matter halo and so in green is the standard halo model this maxwellian exponential distribution with a velocity dispersion that's determined by the local circular speed, which is taken to be 220. And then the sort of lines are the results from the simulations. And then the red curves are fitting a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution to the simulations, but allowing the velocity dispersion to vary, to be different from the standard halo model. So the dark matter only one, you're seeing that this shape varies very significantly, not just from the standard halo model, but from any Maxwellian, whatever you tweak the velocity distribution, you sort of end up with a different shape. However, once you add in the baryons, the Maxwellian is still not a good fit, but if you increase the velocity dispersion in this middle panel and in the right one, you see that you can act a Maxwellian just with a different velocity dispersion gives you a good fit. My understanding is that it's not completely unexplained why this is, but I think what it is, is this baryonic contraction that once the baryons come in and make the density profile in the inner region steeper, it turns out the point at which the slope is going through minus two, i.e. the scale radius, ends up lying very close to the solar radius. So it just happens that we end up living at the point in the halo where the logarithmic slope is minus two, and hence the velocity distribution is close to what you expect for the sort of simple standard halo model. So in terms of the velocity distribution, it looks like actually the sort of simple standard halo model is a, turns out to be a pretty good fit. However, there are deviations from it. And in particular, in the sort of form of these wiggles, which are most, they vary how prominent they are from halo, simulated halo to simulated halo. In this particular case, they're you know, really quite prominent that we've got this excess of high speed particles. And these are what have been called debris flow. And so this comes back to the thing that the assumption that the Milky Way halo has reached a steady state 
isn't a good assumption. So these things aren't um, tidal streams, thin, coherent, spatially coherent streams of dark matter with a single velocity. This is material from something that's been disrupted. It's been torn to bits and spread out all over the place, but it just hasn't had quite enough time for everything to get completely mixed up. And so th these are relics of the formation history of the halo. And if you waited sort of hundreds of giga years, they would presumably go away. But right now they seem to be existing because we haven't quite yet reached a steady state. <clears throat> And an analogy to this that um, I've put on Padlet as an answer to a question, but I think I'll share it here because it's quite nice. And I think I'm stealing this from Vinny and Tremaine. So imagine a running race on a track. Initially, the runners are all clustered together as they go round. But if you wait long enough, they'll spread out and phase mix. So they're spread relatively evenly all around the track. And how long that takes, well, firstly, it depends on how big your track is, whether it's 400 meters or four miles. And then it also depends on the spread in the speeds of the runners initially. The closer their speed is initially, the longer they stay together as a coherent blob. And so that is a really sort of rough analogy for what's going on here in terms of the sort of spreading out of velocity. So the person who was sort of going, well, why isn't it a steady state? Here, at least from simulations, is the evidence of this. And later on today, we'll also look at some observational evidence from observations of halo stars of the sort of similar sorts of features. So that is it for simulations. So any questions at all about anything I've said about numerical simulations and what they tell us about the dark matter distribution? Any questions? Doesn't look like it. Okay, so now we'll come on to observations. And so as I sort of emphasized yesterday, simulations are a remarkably powerful tool for trying to understand how dark matter is distributed. But at the end of the day, we want to observe the real universe and sort of get as much of a handle as we can there. So the thing that's absolutely changed the game in terms of understanding the Milky Way that we live in is the Gaia satellite. And so this is an ongoing ESA mission that I think is roughly coming to the end of its lifetime, but I think the plus question mark there suggests that it might be extended for a bit. And it's what does what's called astrometry. It's measuring the positions parallaxes and proper motions, the change in apparent position of a huge number of stars, more than a billion. And that's roughly 1% of the total number of stars in the Milky Way. And what it can do and how accurately it can do, it sort of varies from star to star. It's easy to do measure distances from nearby things. It's harder for further away things. But if you know you're really interested, those sort of three lines at the bottom underneath the first blue heading to tell you exactly what it can do for different numbers of stars. You then combine data from Gaia with data from what's called spectroscopic surveys, where they um, take the spectra of the light from the stars. And that's useful because you can measure what's called the metallicity, in particular, the sort of abundance of iron. And that's useful for sort of unraveling things. The, the halo is mostly made of dark matter, but there will be stars that are stars in the halo, which have been carried in with the dwarf, yeah, the dwarf galaxies that have built up the Milky Way. And so what people want to be able to do is sort of tag which stars are part of the disk, which stars are part of the halo, and sort of so on and so forth. And so sort of apogee rave and however this is pronounced are the things that people tend to sort of use as well. Now, I've sort of divided things up, simulations, observations, but actually the division isn't that clear cut. And often to interpret the observations, you need modeling and in particular relying on the results of numerical simulations. And then the point I keep banging on about is that the systematic errors from if the assumptions in your modeling aren't quite correct, those errors are often now comparable to the statistics errors and we'll see a really clear-cut example of that in a moment. <clears throat>
So if you want to know more about what we know about the properties of the Milky Way, I'm just focusing here on the dark matter halo, but we've learned a huge amount about the Milky Way, sort of the disk, the, the stars. And so Amina Helmy's recent annual reviews and astronomy article is the place to go for that. If you're interested in uh, the implications for dark matter experiments, then Kieran O'Hare, who did his PhD with me a few years ago and is now a postdoc in Sydney, he's got some really nice slides from talks on his website, and those are sort of clickable links there, which sort of goes into great detail about the consequences of what I'm going to tell you for WIMP direct detection and axion experiments. So we'll start off with something fairly simple, the local dark matter density, i.e. what is the density of dark matter at the solar radius, which is what controls the total rate at which dark matter particles pass through your detector. So there's a really nice review paper by Justin Reed going back to 2014 when he explains this in great detail. There's been progress in observation since then. So this more recent review sort of updates the status of where we are with measurements. And broadly, the techniques come in two classes. Local ones just use how fast stars are moving locally to us. G global ones use data from throughout the Milky Way. And for instance, this thing called mass modeling. And in this case, what you do is you come up with a model for the Milky Way the luminousness components and the halo and how you think their densities all vary with radius. And then you use a whole bunch of data sets, for instance, rotation curves, which we'll look at in a moment, halo stars, how fast they're moving around, constraints on the surface mass density from how stars move in the disk and the total mass. And so you then constrain your model and then look at what the local density of your model is. So there are loads of different ways of doing this. I've sort of just picked one because this person seems to be an expert on the rotation curve of the Milky Way, something they've worked on for many, many years. And so we looked at rotation curves of spiral galaxies back at the in section two for the evidence for dark matter. Here's the rotation curve of the Milky Way. And it turns out it's a bit harder to measure it because we're actually sat in the middle of it. But nonetheless, here is a compilation of a large number of data sets, rotation speed, hundreds of kilometers a second as a function of radius. And so the solar radius would be somewhere in where my arrow is pointing to. So I guess a few things to point here out here. If you know anything about data, you're already sort of wondering what's going on here with these sort of error bars that are all overlapping. And really, we expect data to be scattered around. And what's going on here, I'm almost certain, but haven't checked, is these error bars are correlated. They're not independent data points. But what we're seeing is this is not exactly flat, as we sort of already talked about, but pretty close to flat. It's roughly flat in, at the solar radius. So this is perhaps more confirmation that we're living at a point where the slope of the density profile is roughly minus 2. And for a best fit Navarro Frank White profile, i.e. the thing that seems to come out of numerical simulations, this work finds a low dark matter density of 0.36 GV per cubic centimetre plus or minus 0.02. So that's a pretty small statistical error bar here. And yesterday I said that in WIMP direct detection experiments, the standard density that people use is 0.3 GV per cubic centimeter. So this would suggest that, you know, that's not too far off. This is from the recent review paper of a compilation of all the recent determinations. So going down the left column tells you who wrote the paper and when. I, the color coding, we've got measurements from local stars at the top going down through rotation curves in navy blue, mass modeling that I just talked to you about in red, something called genes modeling using the velocities and density of disk stars um, from circular velocity measurements and then from halo stars in green. And so the bottom axis is the local dark matter density measured in particle physics units, i.e. GV per cubic centimetre, 
The top axis is the equivalent astronomical measure, as in solar masses per cubic parsec. And the equivalent of 0.3 GeV per cubic centimetre is 0.08 solar masses per cubic parsec. And so what we're seeing here is that these things are all broadly consistent, but the scatter in them is probably bigger than some of the error bars. So this, again, is telling us that the systematic modelling uncertainties are bigger than the statistical uncertainties. And then I guess the other single takeaway lesson here is that these things tend to be lying a little bit above the sort of standard 0.3 GeV per cubic centimetre. So maybe that's a little bit low, but I don't think the community have yet reached a consensus on exactly what the correct value is. So for now, at least, the experimentalist sticking with 0.3 seems sensible to me. Right, so then let's come on to the local circular speed. So this is the speed at which the sun is moving around the center of the galaxy. This is important for two reasons. As we've already seen, the velocity dispersion of the dark matter particles is related to the circular speed, or at least they're two different probes of the same thing. And in, as I've got a footnote at the bottom of this slide, in the standard HALO model, there's a simple one-to-one -one relationship. Once you've measured the circular speed, you know what the dispersion is. But in general, this, this sort of relationship is model dependent. And the second reason it's important is if you're doing a lab-based experiment, what you need to know is the dark matter distribution in the lab frame. So you need to know what the circular speed is to do your Galilean transformation between the rest frame of the halo and the rest frame of your detector. So as with the local density, there are lots of ways of um, determining this. One quite neat way which I've got at the top of this slide, is using the proper motion of Sagittarius A star. So this is the massive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. We're moving in a circular ob orbit. So whilst that is more or less stationary, to us it looks like it moves because of our motion. So it has proper motion. And loosely, the thing that's easy to measure is the angular speed, i.e. the circular speed divided by our radius. And so that's something that's sort of been done quite some time ago. The development here is the thing I emphasized yesterday, that we now have this really precise measurement of the solar radius, as in exactly how far away we are from the galactic center by looking at the motion of a particular star around Sagittarius A star. And using that new precise, accurate measurement of the solar radius, you end up with this measurement for the local circular speed. So two, four, or eight, plus or minus seven. And so the standard halo model, it's 220 kilometers a second. So again, this is sort of tentatively suggesting that actually the real value might be a bit bigger. There are various other ways of measuring the circular speed. I'll just mention one of them because it's an excuse to tell you about something that it might be useful for you to hear about. And that something is what's called genes analysis. So it starts from the collisionless Boltzmann equation. So that's the telling us the phase space distribution F df dt equals zero. You then rewrite that in cylindrical coordinates and then take moments of it. And when you do that, what you end up with is this expression for the circular speed squared. And remember the circular speed is determined by the, log of the slope of the potential evaluated living in the disk where we do, we end up with an expression for that in terms of things that can be measured, the mean of the various components of the velocities of anything that's living in the potential, and then their density, which is sort of new here. So the idea here is you look at stars that are sort of tracing the potential, you measure how fast they're going, you work out their density, and then pop it in the right hand side here, and out comes a measurement of the local circular speed, so here we go, the results of this paper doing this using Gaia data plus various other sources of data comes out at about 2.30 with this tiny statistical error. But they say themselves that actually the systematic uncertainties are much bigger. They're of order two to 5%. And the uncertainties here, for instance, are coming from not understanding properly what the density of the trace of stars is. So 
Yeah, let me just pause here in case there are any questions. I think somebody's got their mic on remotely at least. Yeah. Um, this is, I think, probably a pretty basic question. Um, but when we're talking about this circular speed, is it possible that the, the dark matter, the halo, is also also has some, some circular velocity, or are we assuming that the dark matter is staying stationary? So I guess what you're asking about is, does the halo have bulk rotation? And so the answer is that that's something which sort of maybe it's not obvious that it doesn't, but in fact, in simulations, it turns out not to be the case. And I guess where it will come from physically is other nearby um, halos would torque the Milky Way halo as it formed and potentially it could have net angular momentum so that it's rotating. But it seems like maybe there's some net angular momentum and maybe it changes a bit with radius, but it's certainly not thought to be a big thing. So on average, the dark matter particles are moving up sort of around, not completely randomly, they might have orbits that are more radially biased than angularly, but they're, they're, we don't think there's any net bulk rotation of the dark matter halo. Um. So I guess I don't quite understand why wouldn't like the small, like the sub halos get caught up in that, um, the gravitational potential that's causing Milky Way to orbit? Um, so you're asking why the sort of um, sub halos don't end up going round in circles like the disk. Is that what you're asking? Exactly. And I guess it's angular momentum again. The thing that sort of allows the stars to collapse into a disk is because they interact and so they can share angular momentum and sort of hence you get everything collapsing in and going around. Whereas sort of if you looked at the sort of the movie I showed of sort of the formation of a Milky Way like halo, the subhalos are sort of coming in along these filaments and then it's just gravity. That's the only thing that's sort of going on is gravity is what determines how they orbit in this potential. Okay, that helps. Thank you. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was wondering on the slide when you have the rotation curves and the error bars, uh, I don't understand why there's a concentration of points with lower distances. I don't understand this, why the errors would be correlated, like you said. Oh, so this one. Um, so concentration of points at lower distances, that will just become be because it's easy to measure easier to measure data nearby to us. And in terms of why in particular the data is correlated in this case, I'm a theorist, I couldn't tell you, but it's something that happens in both observational and experimental data, that when what's happening in this bin and that bin aren't completely independent of each other, you get these correlated data points, whereas if they weren't correlated, there'd be more scatter. You don't ex expect to sort of have your error bars all overlapping if these are one sigma error bars, and your data is uncorrelated. But I, as a theorist, am the last person in the universe who's qualified to talk about exactly what's causing the correlations. So that was a throwaway comment that perhaps I shouldn't have made, but it was really in case this data was rigging any alarm bells in the heads of people who are used to data and knowing that it should be scattered. Any, anything else? Uh, it doesn't look like it, so it's, you can go on. Okay, so then we come to trying to measure the density profile of the Milky Way. And again, this is turns out to be difficult because we're sat in it. And in particular, it's difficult to measure the inner slope. Is it minus one like NFW? Is it steeper? Or is it sort of shallower in a center of density core? And the problem here is in sort of big galaxies like the Milky Way, the baryons really dominate in the central regions. And there's something, and again, maybe there, this is a tangent I shouldn't be mentioning, but I'll mention it because it's sort of intriguing to me. It doesn't get much attention, but microlensing surveys you'll hear about 
when it comes to primordial black holes. Normally people look at the large Magellanic clouds. So you're looking through the dark matter halo and you're measuring compact objects in the dark matter halo. But microlensing is a huge astronomical technique and you can also get microlensing by stars. So if you look at the galactic center, what you're then doing is measuring the amount of stars in between us and the galactic center. And the experiments in particular, I think it's Ogle that do this, they measure what's called a large optical depth. They see a lot of microlensing events, which are thought to be due to stars. And so that's telling us there's actually a, a lot of stars in the middle of the Milky Way. And there's, that doesn't then leave us much room to have, we know roughly what the total matter density is. And so if you think you've measured how much there is in stars, that doesn't leave you much room for dark matter. So there's a, this argument by sort of Binney and Evans, who are really two of the people who do galactic dynamics, saying that actually these high microlensing optical depths are sort of in tension with having a sort of cuspy, sharply increasing dark matter profile in the Milky Way. So that's just, I think, a sort of something to bear in mind, but people don't seem to worry about this as perhaps as much as they it seems like they should. So maybe there's some argument why this isn't a problem that I'm not aware of. But coming back to the main point, so you can do the sort of dynamical modeling I've sort of already told you about with rotation curves and sort of have a look at what you end up with is your dark matter profile. And this is the result of one attempt to do it. So yet again, we've got log of density versus log of radius with sort of a best fit as the solid line. Here's the solar radius with the fairly accurately measured local density. And this seems to be showing that it doesn't sort of flatten off to a big constant density core, but it looks to be flattening off a bit. So I think the sort of take home point here is we really don't have a good understanding for what the density profile of the Milky Way is doing right in the inner regions. That's something that's just very hard to get to grips with. Dwarf galaxies, though, they're a lot easier, it turns out, thankfully. And so dwarf galaxies are interesting because, as you'll learn from Tracy Slate here, they're a good target for WIMP indirect detection searches via gamma rays. And the reason for that is because they're these sort of small, boring galaxies, there's not a lot of messy physics going on producing gamma rays via other processes. And then they, because they're small, they form early, so they're dark matter dominated. So this makes it sort of somewhat easier to sort of measure their density profiles. And so this is a plot of compilations of the measurements of the inner slope of the density profile. So this inner slope gamma, what does it tend to as you go towards r equals zero? And so the, the y-axis is what that slope is. The x-axis is the stellar mass. And so sort of this goes out to sort of Milky Way size things on the right hand side and then going down on the left hand side to dwarf galaxies. So the NFW profile I've added in corresponds to this line with a constant inner slope minus one. A constant density core would be a line coming across at zero. And so what you see here is the error bars are large. You know, this is hard to do in any individual case, but very tentatively, it seems like sort of bigger galaxies, rotation curves seem to be compatible with something close to NFW. When you go down to smaller dwarf galaxies, there's you know, perhaps some evidence that they tend to have flatter central profiles. So, yeah, no, I think I'll, I'll carry on and then I'll poke pause to collect lots of questions about observations. So we talked about in the theory section that the standard halo model assumes that the Milky Way halo is infinite, but in fact it's finite. And then that means that very high speed dark matter particles would escape from the Milky Way. And so the way we usually handle this is to just truncate the speed distribution at the escape speed, i.e. the minimum speed from which you can get out of the Milky Way. And so people do this by looking at how fast high velocity stars, halo stars are moving. And if a star is part of the halo, that's giving us a sort of limit if it's anything faster than the escape speed wouldn't be part of the halo. So that sort of gives you a limit. And you can sort of do a bit better than just looking at the fastest star and the error bars on it. You can combine with results from 
numerical simulations. And so theoretically, what you expect in the very tail of the distribution is that the speed distribution is just a power law of the speed relative to the escape speed. And numerical simulations tell us that the index of this power law should be somewhere in this sort of range between about two and four. And so there have been some various refinements to doing this. And it's something where actually sort of the modeling and how you get from the data and the simulations is a bit messy. And so people, I think the bottom line, the takeaway message here is the escape speed seems to be coming out at something between 500 and 600 kiloparsecs, but with really quite significant errors. Although, as I told you, sort of when I first mentioned this yesterday, exactly what the escape speed is in most cases doesn't matter because we've got this broad velocity distribution and it's just a cut off in a tail. So for standard WIMPs, it's not too much of a problem. The case where it could affect your results is if you've got light dark matter and you're only sensitive to the tail of the distribution. And in that case, this uncertainty wouldn't be negligible. Right, so here onto something which then reinforces the argument that no, the Milky Way's dark matter halo hasn't reached a steady state. And so this is something that was sort of discovered um, a few years ago. It's got two different names. Some people call it Gaia Enceladus or Gaia Sausage. And we'll see where the sausage name comes from in a moment. And so this is the aftermath of a relatively major merger when a dwarf galaxy weighing about 10 to the 11 solar masses merged with the Milky Way sort of eight to 10 giga years ago. So in a moment, I'm gonna come out of my slides and show you a sort of a movie of simulations of this process. And I think if I'm remembering correctly, the blue points are gonna be sort of the Milky Way and the red points are going to be this dwarf galaxy coming in. So now let me just come out oh, to the movie and check that everything's going to work there. Okay, so before I start it, can you now see a sort of move a black box with some, a blue spiral galaxy in it? If somebody could, yeah, thumbs up, great. So I will now start this going. And so what we've got initially is the Milky Way here, and then the dwarf galaxy is gonna come in in red. And so as it sort of orbits back and forth through the middle of the Milky Way, it gets torn to bits really quite quickly. And so by the present day, you end up with um, the material, the stars and the dark matter from this dwarf galaxy being spread out across large regions of the Milky Way. But as we'll see in a moment, when you look at the velocity distribution at any one point, there are still features in the velocity distribution from the fact this material hasn't completely spread out yet. And so just to emphasize again, that this movie, when the box rotated, that's like that's the sort of thing that's been done visually just to, for you to be able to have a good look all the way around. Okay, so let's come out of the movie and back to my slides and get everything working again there. I can get the chat window open again. So can you now see a slide which says Gaia Enceladus sausage at the top and then a figure which is blue and red at the bottom? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, great, thanks. Somebody's confirmed this. So observationally, what you can see is not the dark matter, it's the stars that have come in with this dwarf galaxy. And those stars have radially biased objects orbits, meaning that the component of their velocity in the radial direction is typically bigger than the component in the angular direction. So this is just a sort of heat map of sort of simple model, radial velocity and theta component. And so um, for a sort of nice smooth spherical halo, this would be spherical, the contours, but for the sausage, it looks like 
the contours are elongated in the radial direction. And so hence where this is where the name the Gaia sausage comes from. So this is something that's definitely there. The stars have been seen. The difficult question then is how much dark dark matter there is associated with this. So this is then where you have to do simulations and sort of try and re reproduce merges, which end up producing a stellar distribution like this. And it seems that the sort of local dark matter distribution, about 10 to 30% of the local dark matter density is going to be dark matter, which is associated with this merger event that is part of this Gaia sausage. So it doesn't dominate the local density, but it's not negligible either. So that is sort of a, a bulk feature. We also yesterday looked at movies of the tidal stripping of an individual dark matter subhalo. And so this tidal stripping is when the gravitational force, the difference across the two sides of the halo is greater than the self gravity and hence the material gets torn off from either side as it orbits. So it turns, so these sort of tidal streams, these are going to come from smaller mergers or more recent mergers where something's going round and materials just gradually being torn off of it rather than it just being completely shredded as we just saw for the sort of Gaia sausage. And observationally, there are a sort of bunch of, sort of detections of streams. And in this case, I think detections are up sort of you do analysis and you think you're seeing it in your data, but some of these I'm not 100% sure sort of how robust they are. So there's things that have been called S1, long standing Helmi streams. I think they're very well established that they're definitely there. And then something called, I think, NICS. I, when people give the things clever names, I then can't pronounce them. And so this is data from Gaia from that latest stream. And so sort of two things here, sort of three things here. Um, the part on the left is the radial and theta components of the velocity. So you see this is really a very coherent feature where all the sort of stars have similar velocities. And then the other two panels are the position distributions in X and Y and X and Z. And so again, you're seeing that these are really tidal streams are these really sort of quite coherent features. So from a dark matter direct detection point of view, you as well as the sort of smooth distribution of dark matter coming from all directions, a tidal stream would be like a hose pipe sharing dark matter particles with a particular speed at you. However, these tidal streams, each one of them only makes up a small contribution to the local dark matter density. So they don't have such a big effect individually. And as I sort of said before, um, tidal streams actually turn out to be interesting for other reasons. And somebody asked the question earlier about how can we probe the abundance of subhalos observationally? And we'll talk tomorrow about how the effects of subhalos on tidal streams is one of the ways that we can probe subhalos. So that wraps up everything I had to say for about observations. And we're really doing extremely well for time today. So there is plenty of time for lots of questions about either observations or simulations. Yeah. Um, how did astrophysicists figure out that the merger that causes the Gaia sausage, um, how did they figure out that that merger happened in the first place? Was it looking at that weird velocity distribution? This is a really good question. And you are sort of, yeah, this is getting sort of way beyond sort of what I've sort of looked into detail. But it's, I think it actually the field gets called sort of galactic archaeology. And so it's piecing together all the data you have about not just the velocities of the stars, but also their chemical composition. And I think that's the key thing which allows you to sort of go backwards in time and understand things. And I'm just trying to find. And so Amina Helmi is kind of the world expert on this sort of thing. And I think this annual review paper, she really goes into a lot of detail. In terms of the exact story, I think my dim memory, but it's one of those stories that I didn't follow initially. I only started following it once it became clear it had implications for dark matter detection experiments. Is I think you know this initially just started showing up as a weird feature 
in the velocity distribution of halo stars. And then there was this detective work to combine other information to work out the, the story of how it came apart about. Okay, that's interesting, thank you. Also, by the way, we can see your movies moving on the slides. Oh, um, fantastic. Could you give it a second? Yeah, I think it takes maybe five or 10 seconds for them to start, but. Okay, well, unfortunately, that was the last of my movies. So unfortunately, this information has come too late to be useful. Oh, well, when we did a test on Monday, it seemed like they weren't showing. Oh, well. Yeah, Max. Uh, so it's possible I missed this, um, but with these tidal streams, uh, you mentioned briefly, at least uh, the possibility of direct detection. And I'm wondering if you can say more about that or something about indirect detection, maybe. Um, I mean, is it possible that we can see higher uh, annihilation effects, more gamma rays coming from the effect of these tidal streams? Okay, so I'll start with the indirect detection. And I think the answer in that case, I'm fairly sure is a no. And so the indirect detection, the sort of flux of gamma rays, for instance, is proportional to the wimp density squared. And so you really need to be looking at very over dense regions. So pe places people typically look are close to the center of the Milky Way and also these um, dark matter dominated dwarf galaxies. So as far as indirect detection is concerned, the tidal streams would be a relatively modest increase in the density and also coming at a place where actually the overall density isn't high enough to see a signal anyway. So in terms of indirect detection, they're, they, they're not important. It's direct detection that they could in principle be important. So from the standard halo model and from simulations in general, we, if you plot the speed distribution, it's a function that sort of has a peak around a couple of 100 kilometers a second. And um, what you then get with a tidal stream is it's a bunch of particles moving with, they have a small velocity distribution, but they dispersion, but they more or less all have the same speed. So what this does is add a spike into your velocity distribution. You've got your smooth curve from the smooth halo, and then you could get a sort of spike from a tidal stream. How important that is then depends on the type of direct detection experiment. So I'm sort of then sort of treading on the toes of Jody Cooley, I expect. So the differential event rate, either the number of events as a function of energy in a normal direct detection experiment, it turns out it's an integral over the velocity distribution. So basically there's a whole bunch of particles of different speeds that can cause them uh, recall of energy E. So as you vary the recall energy, you vary the speed from which you start integrating over. So what I'm driving at here is that then once you integrate over the smooth distribution, you get an exponentially declining differential event rate. And so if you then add a spike in, you end up getting a step in your differential event rate, as in the stream will either be able to cause recalls of an energy E or it won't. So it depends then how big the density of a particular stream is. And so back, getting on for 20 years ago, we all got quite excited about this Sagittarius dwarf galaxy that I showed you the simulations of. And this, so this is the one the other side of the Milky Way with the tidal streams wrapping round. My understanding is that we now think that the tidal streams from Sagittarius don't come through the solar neighborhood. They pass fairly close, but not through. And if they had, and if the density had been sort of tens of percent in one of these streams, then we would have been able to see it showing up in normal direct detection experiments. But the streams that we now know of that go through the solar neighborhood, their contribution to the local density is really quite small. So they're unlikely to have a significant effect on sort of standard direct detection experiments of WIMPs that just measure the energy. There are caveats though. Directional WIMP detection experiments measure not just the energies of the nuclear recalls, but their directions. So if somebody got one of those working and detected dark matter in it, you can actually do WIMP astronomy. You can map out the, distri the velocity distribution. So in one of those experiments, you really could be seeing some really quite nice clean features from tidal streams. And then axion lab-based experiments, there, once you know what the axion mass is, if you once you've detected it, 
you can then sort of very carefully scan out what the velocity distribution is doing. And once again, you would actually be able to measure sort of the properties of the distribution and do axion astronomy. So yeah, apologies if I went into too much detail there. You've ended up asking about something that I've spent a lot of time working on. So, but hopefully that gives you a sort of rough impression of how and when tidal streams would be important for dark matter sort of lab detection. Uh, just yeah, a follow-up question on the, uh, that was an excellent answer, um, but a uh, follow-up question on the indirect detection. I mean, I guess I'm thinking if there was some source, some dwarf galaxy where there's a tidal stream going near the core, um, I mean, are there any sources like that that might be useful? So you're right, that's the sort of situation where this would come into play. Um... So I think the problem is dwarf galaxies, they are really these very small things. And yes, they would have been made up of mergers of smaller subhalos. But it then turns out to be very hard to study that numerically. And I don't, I just don't think that we expect you would get sort of features in the dark matter distribution showing up in the inner regions that were significant enough to, to sort of perturb the density. So it's one of those questions where I'm sort of saying my intuition is that sort of no, but it's sort of hard for me to sort of point at a, a specific paper demonstrating no. Oh, perfect, thank you. Yeah, so maybe. Oh yeah, I, I just have a follow up question regarding your comment. So for a direct detection experiment, what are you expected to see when you have this tidal stream throwing dark matter at you? So suppose that they're really throwing you there. So let me just check I heard that correctly. So you're basically saying, what would one expect to see in a WIMP direct detection experiment in the presence of a tidal stream? Because you see that they were throwing it kind of like just missing us, but suppose they are throwing it at us. What, what, what would you see? You can answer, but I was a bit too far for to catch. Right, so, so just to sort of clarify, Sagittarius, the stream from that we now think just misses us, whereas these ones I've sort of, oops, let's come back, just been talking about these sort of more puny streams, we do think they could sort of come through. The solar neighborhood and so these sort of center and rightmost plots the star is where the sort of sun is with this arrow sort of indicating the direction it's moving in and these sort of purple arrows are the motions of stars in this particular stream and so in this case you can see that yeah they it really does appear to be going through the solar neighborhood so this is sort of something where it, um yeah I'll, I'll try the hand wavy explanation again but so in a WIMP detect direct detection experiment, what you end up with is a differential event rate, the number of events you get as a function of their energy. And that's sort of coming from the kinematics that, you know, scattering of WIMPs off of nuclei, and that there's some minimum WIMP speed that can cause a recall of energy E. And so the bottom line of that is to calculate this differential event rate, you have to take your speed distribution, whatever it is, and integrate it from the minimum speed that can kinematically cause a recall of energy E. So the differential event rate basically is from, comes from an integral over the speed distribution. And so with a Maxwellian speed distribution, you end up with just a smoothly, roughly exponentially declining differential event rate. If you add in a tidal stream, then on top of your smooth distribution, you basically got a spike. Where, where all the dark matter particles have the same speed. And so if you integrate over a Dirac delta function, what you get is a step function. At low energies, then all of the stream WIMPs would be able to cause a recall, so they have this sort of constant contribution, modulate the form factor, but that's overcomplicating things. And then if you go to high enough energies, your stream of WIMPs wouldn't have enough energy to cause recalls, so they would just drop off. So you, on top of the, sort of the smoothly declining differential event rate from the smooth dark matter distribution, you will get a sort of step superimposed on it. Does that, was that better? Really? <laughs> so, so, so just to give a context, because I work in a direct, detector, a direct detection experiment, 
So I'm just wondering if there exists some like spike in my on, on top of the next person think there was a direct delta. What what am I expected to see in my data? Do I see like I'm, I'm explaining it as well as I can by waving my hands around. So without bringing out equations that I don't have to hand because it's not what I was supposed to be talking about. I can't give you a better answer. But as I sort of already sort of recommended, what I'm trying to do in cases like this is sort of tell you where you can go to find out more. And so in this particular case, as sort of I've already recommended, these talk slides that Kieran O'Hare has written, he, these are talks specifically about the implications of the Gaia results for dark matter detection. So he'll go into this, or you can just go to what your favorite literature searching database and search direct detection stream. And you know, the papers there will sort of fill in with equations and graphs what I've been trying to wave my hands about. But it's a it would be an additional contribution to the energy of the nuclear recoils, an addition of constant differential event rate at low energies and zero at high energies. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned that uh, dark matter will fall into uh, like coalescences of baryonic matter. And I was wondering if there were any observations made within like our stellar neighborhood, like our own star, or uh, our immediate stellar neighbors, like I think it's Alpha Centauri, I'm not sure. Um, you showed a lot of galactic data, but I, I was wondering if there were observations made of much closer. Right, so you're sort of just trying to think of, can we sort of unpick what the dark matter is really doing very locally from looking at very local stars? Um, so it's sort of an interesting question, um, because if the dark matter density was really very high, in particular, what it would affect is the orbits of planets in the solar system. But so there's an awful lot of dark matter in galaxies as a whole that, you know, overall, most of the matter in a galaxy is dark matter. However, actually, locally, the dark matter density is tiny. It's really spread out. And so people have sort of looked at, you know, how big the local dark matter density would have to be to start affecting things like the orbits of the planets in the solar system. And the answer is it would just have to be orders of magnitude higher than it actually is. So actually, you know, dark matter is very diffuse, it's very spread out. And so hence it's sort of difficult to sort of try and find it having any effects on things locally. So it's one of those ideas that it's one of those in principle, it's a good idea, but then when you go away and work out the details, it turns out that no, the effects are just too small to be measured. Thank you. Uh, you had a question. Yeah, so this is a question about simulations. Um, I don't expect it to have much importance, but I wonder if there are simulations that try to differentiate between like different um, particle candidates of dark matter, and if that has an impact on sort of the, the overall result. Okay, so that's a good question what I've been sort of talking about so far is just vanilla cold dark matter which only has gravitational interactions and it turns out that's a pretty good approximation to a wimp um I will say more tomorrow about self-interacting dark matter and warm dark matter and so people have indeed done simulations for those types of dark matter candidate and you do see some differences in the things I've said today so that is a question that will hopefully be answered tomorrow and then you also have some lectures later in the school from Lam Hui who he's going to be looking at what's called fuzzy ultralight dark matter and that's when the dark matter is so light that the corresponding wavelength actually corresponds to astronomical scales and hence again you get differences from the things I've told you so indeed yes the nature of dark matter can affect how it's distributed and people have done simulations about it and we'll be telling you more about that later on that has gotten us like any closer to understanding like which candidate could be say more uh um, likely than others.
Not yet, but I think let's hold this question to tomorrow when I sort of talk about it in a bit more detail. I think I thought, yeah, go ahead. Um, so I think I maybe misunderstood something. So you have this plot where you were plotting the, the slope of the density for dwarfs and for like bigger galaxies. <laughs> And you said that bigger galaxies have a slope that is more, uh, that is better estimated by the NFW profile. I, I would guess that because the kind of effects that we talked about, like periodic contraction and stellar feedback, they, they result in cores. So I would expect that larger galaxies are more cored than dwarfs, which have like smaller periodic effects, or are they like competing effects which kind of turn, once again, uh, these, these cores to cusp somehow? No, this is a really good question, and I think it's just showing quite how messy the physics is, and I don't have an intuitive understanding of this either. Annika Peter later in the school would be the person to sort of talk to about this. Um, if I sort of come back to here, it's... Um, yeah, it's coming down to this sort of when you decide the gas is dense enough to form stars. And I don't have an intuitive sort of intuition as to why actually this sort of happens more easily in dwarf galaxies than Milky Way galaxies. So no, it's a good question. And I'd suggest asking it to Annika Peter later in the school. And yeah, Mick. Uh so you mentioned briefly at one point that these, I uh, think anyway, that these tidal streams can be used to locate um, uh, these, this substructure in my halo. Um, and I guess I'm wondering how precisely can we nail down the location of some sub halo and can we look for indirect detection in this dense chunk? So unfortunately it's not as good as low. <laughs> Well, let me, so I'll talk about this in a lot more detail tomorrow and let's leave a detail in answer to tomorrow. But in terms of the tidal streams, you're, you're not actually detecting a specific individual subhalo. You're just looking at the collective effects of a bunch of subhalos having plowed through a tidal stream. So in that case, you're just probing the overall of abundance of subhalos rather than the location of any one. There is an exception, but again, it's not something I know a huge amount about, but I'll mention briefly tomorrow with something called gravitational imaging of strong lensing images. And I think that in that case, you would actually be detecting a specific subhalo in a specific place. But whether your idea then of you then be able to go and try and indirectly detect it works, I'm not sure. I'll have a think about that before tomorrow. Has anyone, I guess I don't, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't have an intuitive feel for the density in these sub halos. It, 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 do you have a guess if there would be a sufficient amount of annihilation in these uh, dense pockets? I can't quote any numbers at you, but my intuition would be no. On the other hand, though, if we, and then I really am thinking aloud here, because, yeah, that's what you have to do when somebody comes up with a sort of, off, you know, out of nowhere idea. If we're looking at dwarf galaxies, sort of further away in the Milky Way halo as targets for the indirect detection, a dwarf galaxy sized clump of dark matter should also be detectable. So it, it's, it's not obvious it, it wouldn't work. But, but I'll try and have a think about this uh, before so, tomorrow. Uh, hi. Uh, how can we really say that um, the distribution of uh, the stars and their velocity actually trace the dark matter distribution? Because I think that's not obvious at all. No, you're absolutely right. It's not obvious at all. And we certainly wouldn't expect them to be identical. So this then is where the modeling and simulations come in to sort of inform, given a particular distribution of stars, what is then the associated dark matter distribution, but you are indeed absolutely right that we don't expect them to be identical. It, it would probably be okay as a zeroth order assumption, but we wouldn't expect it to be sort of a good one. Yeah, uh, there are constraints uh, about the radius of the halos in the galaxy. 
So here, um, how the radius is obviously going to be linked to the mass. And so sort of the biggest dwarf galaxy size things, I think, but again, bear in mind, I'm a theorist, um, we're talking tens of kiloparsecs. And then I haven't really said too much about this, but we had this sort of power law distribution of numbers of subhalos, as in the smaller you go down in mass, the more of them they are. And this comes back to something I mentioned way back on Tuesday, that with WIMPs, you that power law distribution will go right the way down to 10 to minus six solar masses, roughly. So tiny little Earth mass things. And then those tiny little things, if they exist and our theories are correct, they would, I think, have million microparsec radii. So that there's a huge range of scales. The biggest things we're talking to tens of kiloparsecs down to absolutely tiny little things. Yeah, those, and those, uh, I think the follow-up question of the, uh, those halos could follow the stellar density of the stars and planets, or no, they have to be those on the galaxy? So I think I missed a crucial word in that question. You said, so those halos, they could do something to stellar things. So sorry, what, what, was, what was the thing I missed? Uh, so they could follow the density profile of the stellar, stellar density of the galaxy. So no, so the, the, the dense, the sort of spatial distribution of the luminous components of a galaxy and the dark matter components are very different. So most of the stars are sort of lying in a disk with a handful of stars dotted around the halo. And then the dark matter lies in the halo with these sort of sub halos. The biggest sub halos contain stars. They are the dwarf galaxies that we see, but then there's some sort of mass around I'm guessing about 10 to the 7 solar masses where a halo just gets too small to form stars so these smaller dark matter halos they're, they're just they're these just invisible small clumps of dark matter uh yeah uh, so I just had one more question about this uh you mentioned that there was no bulk rotation of the halo um so I guess uh, these subhalos, uh, I mean, either they must be orbiting around or they're slowly falling inward, and the rest of the dark matter is just kind of fumbling around in different directions. Otherwise, it would also be contracting. Is that the right way to think about it? I th think it is more or less right. And let probably now at this point, it would be a good idea to go back to one of the movies I showed you yesterday. So so let's see, can, is this going to run for me? No, that's, hmm. Well, we saw a blip. Ah, so maybe it's running just very slowly. Maybe I'm clicking to, ah, the blip is my laser pointer with me trying to start this. Um, okay, let me see if I can do it like this. Okay, can, can you see the movie now? Yeah, great. Okay, so that is working. So this is sort of showing what, what's happening. So the rotation here is just essentially the camera rotating around, just to give you a better view. Nothing is actually physically rotating. And so this is then with the expansion of the universe factored out. So initially, we're just sort of seeing these, the bright regions here are these sort of initial small dark matter halos forming. And in a moment, we're going to start seeing things sort of getting sort of pulled in. And maybe I shall sort of, oh, no, it's not giving me the sort of bar to speed it up a bit. But you're now getting to the point where you can hopefully just see sort of sub halos coming into the main halo. And so the main halo, it's sort of not a thing that pre-exists. It's a thing that gets built from the mergers and accretion of these sub halos. And sort of most of the sort of matter in the subhalos initially gets torn to pieces and spread out to create this smooth background dark matter distribution. And it's just the sort of dense central regions of some of the halos that end up surviving to be the subhalos and substructure that we see today. Uh, 
So does does that help uh, so, there? So with these substructures, I guess I'm wondering why they aren't constantly being pulled to the center. Yeah, any more questions? Okay, Max, may we uh, repeat? So I, I guess I'm wondering why the uh, substructure is not. I had being actually been going to say a little bit about small scale challenges today. This was something that I had already planned to say, and somebody asked about it earlier in the week. But looking at the time, I don't have so much to say tomorrow about probing the nature of dark matter using astronomical observations. So I think given the huge number of questions we've just had, it will be probably be best if we leave this slide on small scale challenges till tomorrow morning and start tomorrow morning off with that. So I, I will sort of not show you any more new material today, but so then any final questions? I don't know. Can you hear us? Something happened, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, can you hear me? <laughs> Hello? Oh, no. <laughs> I don't think I, I, can't I don't know what anything. to do. Oh, that helps. Oh, I need to. Ah, uh, sorry, I think what happened was I turned my sound down so you couldn't hear the movie. So can you hear us now? Yes, I can. Sorry, that, that was my fault. The, the movie had really cheesy music, so I muted my sound so you wouldn't have the cheesy music inflicted on you. And then I refused to turn it, I, I forgot to turn it back up again. You can hear us now. I can hear you now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Max, I don't know, fourth time. Okay. <laughs> uh, I guess with these uh, substructures forming, I guess I'm wondering if they're rotating around uh, or if they're just constantly coming into the center of their host halo. So they're basically on orbits within the potential of the parent Milky Way. So this thing will come in, it will come into a minimum, it will go back out again, and they just go round and round. Well, and as they go round and round, material gets torn off, etc. So they're not sort of bulk rotating, or, but different halos will be on different or orbits. Yeah, you're happy. <laughs> you're happy. Yeah. I think I saw one more. And maybe I was hallucinating. <laughs> Any other questions? I don't think there are questions uh, in the chat. All right. I think, Anne, we don't have any more questions. Okay, great. Well, tomorrow I'll start off with talking through this stuff about small scale challenges before then going on to trying to probe the nature of the dark matter with astronomical observations. Awesome. Thank you.